Welcome in. This is Benzie's Bit, episode number 16. Glad to be here. Home from work, showered up. It's a beautiful day here in the south metro of Minnesota. About 68 degrees. Nice breeze. Sun is out. And I'm just prepping, man. I'm about, what is it? I think I'm like 16 days now from getting married. It's pandemonium going on right now. I feel like I'm forgetting things and I'm not because my fiance is my rock and she's got it all planned out with her family and my family. My best man, Mike Reeves, on top of his game. It's basically, this wedding is just a putt. It's, it's a gimme putt right now. You just got to put it in. It's all in the hips. Just got to tap it in. But I still feel like I'm swimming and I've got to tread water. It's, it's intense, but we'll get through it. That's what's going on in my life right now. Not to mention full-time job, um, this COVID mask wearing epidemic, pandemic, chaos, Elections coming up, chaos, rioting, chaos. Um, and then I just have to remind myself to be still and to remember to do Benzie's bit. Um, so here I am. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Today is a great show. I'm going to touch base on some fantasy outlooks for your NFL rookies that were recently drafted this season, of course. That's why they're rookies. I'm also going to touch base on the baller of the week, the bonehead of the week, and then the buzz around the sports universe. So let's get started here, first and foremost, with the breakdown. And once again, it is on NFL rookie updates and their fantasy values. Starting with quarterbacks, the number one pick in last year's draft, or this recent year's draft, was Joe Burrow. The cigar-smoking number one overall pick of the draft will be surrounded with arguably one of the better rookie offensive situations in recent memory. This is the NFL, so expect some rookie mistakes along with the way, along the way, especially taking sacks. If the Bengals are near the top 10 of passing volume, Burrow becomes a viable streamer early and could force his way towards a top 12 finish at the quarterback position. I'm really excited to see Joe Burrow this season just to see if his last year of college football was a mirage. I think he is very talented, but if you look back on stats prior to that, constant transfer, things of that nature, it's exciting to me to see how he meshes with the Cincinnati offense and I mean, the guy's got swag. He's dripping swag, but just to see if that translates into the NFL will be very exciting. The number five pick was Tua Tungavailoa. Tanking for Tua somehow worked for the Dolphins, and there is excitement in the air once again in Miami. He could be the first capable Dolphins quarterback since Dan Marino, but will need some time to adjust and hopefully be fully healthy. That's a big hopefully. Early reports are that he's ahead of his recovery schedule from his 2019 hip injury and surgery. We still expect Fitzmagic to be the favorite to start week one. The number six draft pick was Justin Herbert. Depending on who you talk to, Herbert is either a franchise quarterback with multiple tools to become successful at the NFL level or an unwise selection by the Chargers doomed to fail. Herbert will need time as he never took a normal snap under center in college football with the Ducks. He was predominantly out of the shotgun. The Chargers are flush with offensive pass-catching weapons, so there is an opportunity for success if he works on his accuracy and takes advantage of his unique blend of athletic size since he is 6'6 and ran a 4'6'9'40. Number 26. Greg Bauman's favorite pick of the draft, Jordan Love. Perhaps the biggest surprise of the 2020 NFL draft was the Packers taking Jordan Love in the first round, moving up to get him. Of course, while Aaron Rodgers is there, Love will be riding the bench and learning, which is probably the only positive of them taking him. 
Now going into the wide receiver section at number 12 was Henry Ruggs III. Most expected Jerry Judy or C.D. Lamb, but the Raiders went for the big play speedster. He's likely to step into an every down roll and is excellent after the catch. However, there will be many growing pains, as with any rookie, and the offense may limit his upside. You got Carr at quarterback, maybe Mariota, depending on how that goes. I love the running game for the Las Vegas Raiders. It will be very interesting to see how Ruggs fits in there and if he can stay out of stupid mistakes. I mean, he cut his thigh open moving with a friend in the offseason. So that in of itself is a, a setback, but everybody expects him to still be a speed demon. Will he be the next Tyreek Hill? That's still way too early to say. The With the 15th pick, Jerry Judy was taken by the Denver Broncos. Judy should have an every down roll from day one with the Broncos. I love his upside as a rookie wide receiver number two, especially if Drew Locke makes that next step as an NFL franchise quarterback, which that has been a very cursed position for Denver in the past years. So we'll see if Drew Locke is actually that franchise guy. With the 17th pick, uh, it was C.D. Lamb who went to the Cowboys. It's a big contract to Mari Cooper and sneaky 2019 breakout Michael Gallup. While there's a lot of mouths to feed in Dallas, it's a high-powered offense, and even Randall Cobb had a few fantasy-relevant weeks last season. If Dallas employs a three-wide receiver set often, Lamb will have a chance to show what he can do that is a tough one as well. You got Zeke, you got Amari, Gallup, Blake Jarwin. I expect to get a lot of targets. It will be it will be interesting. I don't see CD having a great year this year, but if you're in a dynasty league and you could have grabbed him, he he will be relevant. It's just what weeks will he be relevant? That's where you're throwing darts at a dartboard. At number twenty one was Jalen Rager. Uh, with the tight end duo of Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard, they will take up a huge majority of the targets in Philly. Rager is someone you can take a chance on in late rounds of the draft with his potential immediate opportunity. Um, it, it will be interesting to see how Wentz works out with him. They don't really have a bunch of wide receivers that they can deal to. So I think he will get targets. He'll need to start fast, though. I really believe that if Jalen Rager starts fast, he may be a Rookie of the Year candidate. So interesting to see. At number 22, Justin Jefferson to my Minnesota Vikings. In 2019, with the Vikings, Diggs only saw 94 targets. That was even with Adam Thielen missing six games. That was less than other uninspiring fantasy wide receivers such as Cole Beasley, Danny Am Amendola, and Dede Westbrook. That is because we're so run heavy in Minnesota. Kubiak is going to enforce that even more now. I think Justin Jefferson is still viable. I think he will still have a good year, but I don't see him winning you a league, if that makes sense. At number 34, Michael Pittman. Big bodied with a nose for the end zone, this cont contested catch master could deliver early for Phillip Rivers. The team and head coach Frank Wright seem enamored with Pittman, who could start from day one in the offense. Love that pick. Uh, Mike Reeves is super high on him, as am I, and I think that will be a great later round pick for any fantasy team. Now into the running back position. The number 32 pick in this recent draft was Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. Um, Clyde brings a skill set of running and pass catching that will fit in perfectly with Andy Reid's offense. Andy Reid's running backs score fantasy points. The team drafted Clyde over every other running back in the draft, and Patrick Mahomes handpicked him. I took Clyde at the eighth pick in my new dynasty league. That is... Very, it makes my stomach hurt a little bit just because it is a rookie and you don't know. But then again, you think of the Chiefs offense and you see what they can do and you see how many points they put up on any giving night. I love it. I think Clyde will be a beast. I just hope for health. At number 35, DeAndre Swift. 
The Lions will likely use a true committee approach, limiting Swift's upside and making it nearly impossible to project which games he will actually produce. He is a very good player that oozes upside, but a lot of things will need to go his way to see that upside. Number 41, Jonathan Taylor. Taylor is an absolute tank of a human being. He enters the NFL with the six most rushing yards in NCAA history. If Taylor can take the lead back job sooner than later, he will be a fantasy beast. His ADP could make this an expensive proposition as a lot of leagues I've seen him going third, even the fourth round, if you're lucky. And that is the case. I mean, with Marlon Mack there, with Marlon Mack being their starter per se, it will be interesting to see how that goes. If you do spend such a high pick on him, do you play him week one without seeing? Hopefully you have running back depth so you can wait and see what happens. Number 52, Cam Akers. He has the production and build of a three down running back. Although Malcolm Brown and last year's third round pick Daryl Henderson are still around. Drafters will have to decide if they think the team wants to do a full-time running back or if the team has learned a lesson relying so much on one player as they did with Todd Gurley. At number 55, J.K. Dobbins. Dobbins landed in a prime spot for fantasy. He does have a pretty big Mark Ingram problem, though. Fantasy players will likely have to wait until next season to unleash Dobbins, but if Mark Ingram misses time, watch out. And that is the breakdown of the week. Into the baller of the week. My baller is going to be a little complicated because it's not going to be one person. It's going to be a team and their facility. And this team is the Chicago Cubs, and the facility is Wrigley Field. The Cubs announced plans for a sport book at Wrigley Field. Beautiful, brilliant idea. Love it. Completely on board. So today, the Cubs announced a multi-year partnership with DraftKings that includes plans for putting a sports book at Wrigley Field or in Wrigley v- Wrigleyville area outside of the park. And in quotes, An increasing number of sports fans want to integrate sports betting into their game experience, and we're excited to be one of the first to engage in developing a retail sports book at a professional sports venue. That was quoted by Crane Keeney, president of business operations for the Cub. What a brilliant idea. I can't think of anything better right now. You know, I think it's like 16 or 18 states that have made sports betting legal. And you see all the daily fantasy sports that people do on their phones, on apps, on their desktop computers, while they're at work, blah, blah, blah. Betting on sports such as fantasy, March Madness brackets, it makes the consumer more entertained. It makes me lock into the games because there's money on the line. There's competition on the line. And that's what builds a bigger fan base and keeps fans around regardless of what's going on. If I'm in a fantasy league and I don't necessarily agree with what's going on before or during or after a game, I'm still locked in man. Cause I'm got fantasy football. I've got these prop bets going on. I want to see who scores the first touchdown. It was it heads or tails before the game, so on and so forth. So cubbies being brilliant in that aspect of realizing that baseball is losing fans, regardless of what anybody says, baseball is losing fans. This is a great way to get fans back engaged. So that is the baller of the week. At Bonehead of the Week, I have the media who bashed Kirk Cousins. Let's get into this. So the story began with the release of an episode of Spotify's 10 Questions with Kyle Brandt, which is a podcast in which Kirk Cousins was brought on to discuss a number of topics, one being COVID-19. The episode had originally been recorded in July, and Kirk stated this. He was asked about how he, you know, fits on the scale between 1 and 10, 1 being idiots who are, 1 being he thinks people that want to wear masks are idiots, and 10 being You know, it is what it is. And he said, I want to respect what other people's concerns are. For me personally, I would say I'm going to go out about my daily life. If I get it, I'm going to ride it out. I'm going to let nature do its course, survival of the fittest kind of approach, and just say, if it knocks me out, it knocks me out. I'm going to be okay. You know, even if I die, 
If I die, I die. I kind of had peace about that. So that's really where I fall on it. So my opinion on wearing a mask is really about being respectful to other people. It really has nothing to do with my own personal thoughts. That got taken completely out of contest because on context because all that was said on like ESPN, even by our local Fox 9, was that if I die, I die. Survival of the fittest approach. They didn't take into account all the other drops he had about respecting other people's concerns are and how for him it's not about wearing a mask for himself it's about being respectful to other people how oh my god so that gets him dragged through the mud okay so then i'm even surprised he did this but he came out and clarified and this is what his clarification said what i wanted to say then what I would echo again now is that while the virus does not give me a great amount of personal fear, there's still great reason for me to engage in wearing a mask and social, social distancing and washing hands as frequently as I can and following protocols that have been set in place. Obviously, to be respectful and considerate of other people, which is very important. You can say what you want about Kirk Cousins' game. You can say what you want about how he can't close. He can't play well in primetime games, yada, yada, yada. You can say what you want. But Kirk Cousin is a great human being. And for people to grab this out of context and rip him apart because of certain wordage he used back in July is hogwash. And that's what's wrong with the culture right now in the media in the United States is that a guy can go from saying this because he wants to show us he is human. You know, so much we put athletes on this pedestal, whereas they can't, we can't relate to them. This is what he's trying to do. He's trying to just have a good time in this podcast, answer a couple questions, and sure enough, he gets torn apart. Unfortunately, what's going to happen is guys like him aren't going to want to answer questions. They're going to give them the Mike Zimmer approach and they're just going to say, yeah, it's pretty crazy. End of, you know, the Bill Belichick point of view where he doesn't say many words because this is what happens when you say too much. When you try to give your point of view, people don't want other people's point of view. They just want to hear what they agree with. They don't want to hear what they disagree with. And that is too bad. So poor Kirk onto the buzz. Brooklyn Nets hire Hall of Famer Steve Nash as a head coach. It is a four-year contract. General Manager Sean Mark stated, In Steve, we see a leader, communicator, and mentor who will garner the respect of our players. I have had the privilege to know Steve for many years, one of the great on-court leaders in our game. I have witnessed firsthand his selfless approach to prioritizing team success his instincts for the game combined with an inherent ability to communicate with and unite players towards a common goal will prepare us to compete at the highest level. I love this signing. I love Steve Nash. I grew up loving Steve Nash. Um, he is the definition of a facilitator and to see him trying to do that at the coaching level, which is something he hasn't really wanted to do. The situation had to be right. I bet you, you know, the cash obviously had to be right, but the roster had to be right as well. And this roster is full of it. You're going to have Durant, Kyrie, and things of that nature. So good for him. Congratulations, Brooklyn. You got yourself a beast. Seahawks resign suspended wide receiver Josh Smoke'em Up Gordon. Gordon was suspended indefinitely by the NFL on December 16th for violations of the league policies on performance-enhancing substances and substances of abuse. In his sixth seat, it, it was his sixth suspension since 2013 and his fifth for some form of substance abuse. Gordon has applied for reinstatement and is awaiting the result. I have no reason to believe that he wouldn't be reinstated, especially since the NFL is now, for the most part, pro-weed, which why pump people full of opiates if marijuana works for them? It's tough. Um, so good for Josh Gordon. Good for the Seahawks. 
the Seahawks still had him last season and he was more of a mirage. He didn't really get a lot of work in, but you know, that's still a wide receiver that role that they needed to fill and they got him. Leonard Fournette agrees to deal with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Let's go. I'm pumped up about this, and let me read this first. The agreement is for a one-year deal and could be worth up to $3.5 million with incentives. Fournette had his best season statistically in 2019, rushing for a career-best 1,152 yards and catching 76 passes for 522 receiving yards with three to- total touchdowns, which I need that number to go up this season touchdown-wise. Um, why am I pumped up? Because in my dynasty league, when I saw that he was released by the Jaguars, I traded Raheem Mostert for him. Um, hopefully for him finding a good role. Now I'm not necessarily as pumped up about the role that he will have in Tampa Bay as of today. You know, that's not to say that he couldn't be RB1. I hope that he will be RB1 considering who they have there. But I'm very pumped up that he found a competitive team that has a lot of hype around him. Hopefully they feed him the ball. Hopefully they get him an opportunity to make up incentives since that is a huge part of his contract. Good for him. New England Patriots to release Mohamed Sanu. Mohamed Sanu was acquired by the Patriots last October from the Atlanta Falcons for a second round pick. That's a significant investment that resulted in Sanu playing only nine games for the team. Sanu was due to earn $6.5 million this season, which is a high figure based on his projected role as the number four option who doesn't contribute on special teams. Furthermore, because the Patriots are locked in with Julian Edelman and 2019 first round pick Nikhil Harry, as their two top receivers, giving them one of the slower top tandems in the NFL, their ideal third receiver would be someone with speed, which that is not Mohamed Sanu. So Mohamed Sanu is out there. I'd have no doubts that he will find a home somewhere. It just will be interesting to see where, but that ain't going to be with Belichick. The Titans reach a deal with ex-Patriots kicker Steven Gaskowski. Gaskowski is a former teammate of Titans head coach Mike Vrabel, who was with the Patriots during Stevens' first three seasons, 2006 through 2008. Um, Gaskowski, who is coming off left hip surgery that shortened his 2019 season to four games, had been the Patriots' full-time kicker since 2006 when he replaced Adam Vinatieri. He is the franchise career scoring leader, with 1,775 points. The Miami Heat go up two to nothing on the Bucks as Jimmy Buckets sinks free throws after time expires in a wild finish. Giannis Antetokounmpo sat on the bench in disbelief as Jimmy Butler sank a pair of free throws with an empty lane and no time on the clock Wednesday night. The Bucks are the 12th team to trail two to nothing in the best of seven series after having the best record in the NBA during the regular season. Green Bay, Greg, please close your ears. The previous 11 teams all lost the playoff series and only one of those series went seven games. A lot of stuff going on in Milwaukee. We'll see how that pans out. Thank you all for joining me this week. Make sure you guys go on Twitter. Follow me at TwistBenz. Also, make sure to check me and Green Bay Greg out this Saturday on Twist. We will be going live right around noon central. Other than that, make sure to go and like us on Facebook at Twist The Weekend Sports Talk. Make sure you're watching Green Bay Greg's show. Make sure you're watching Mike on the Mic and myself and catch up on all the past Twist shows and last but not least look up in the corner of the screen you see that rtf logo go to rtfsportsnetwork.com and indulge in a bunch of amazing shows on a daily basis hourly basis half hour basis you're gonna see all the best and they're all human beings who are just doing this because they love sports all right guys have a good rest of your week i will see you next week god bless